Well, today in our study from the book of Nehemiah, as we're making our way through Nehemiah, deals with that life experience and process that Jesus' followers refer to as walking with the Lord, living by faith. Now, some might think that when they hear walking with the Lord and living by faith, that these are laughably elementary subjects to be talking about. But in truth, our lives never really move beyond these core things. This is living life, walking with the Lord, living by faith. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ yet, I want to tell you that walking with the Lord through life is one of the most exciting and challenging things you will ever experience. Your life will take on a new dimension, a spiritual dimension that it didn't have before. Some think this new dimension is going to be some weird twilight zone type thing, but it's not. It's really pretty natural. In fact, it's more natural than your life has ever been before because we were created to know God, to walk with God, to have relationship, fellowship with him. When we talk about walking with the Lord, we're really talking about living a life in good relationship with God and living the kind of life that we were made for. Because we were all made to walk with God, to live with God, to have fellowship with him. Well, a little background for our story of Nehemiah as we get into the text this morning. As you might recall, the book of Nehemiah begins with the Jewish man Nehemiah living in the Persian Empire around 445 B.C., working for King Artaxerxes as a cupbearer. The job of cupbearer may not sound very impressive in our day. We might immediately think that a cupbearer is similar to a busboy or a dishwasher. Someone who carries cups for a living, namely back and forth from the kitchen to the table. But that's not what a cupbearer was. It was actually a position holding tremendous trust and influence with the king. Among other things, the cupbearer was responsible for tasting everything before the king ate it, especially the wines, to ensure that there was no poisoning going on, someone attempting to kill the king. In addition to the role of taster, the cupbearer was expected to be a tactful and pleasant companion of the king. He was someone who listened to the king as he talked through difficult decisions that he was faced with, someone who gave informal counsel when asked, someone who was always pleasant to be around, sought to lift the king's spirits. Well, in this sense, the cupbearer was really similar to the classic role of a good bartender at the local tavern. The guy quietly polishing the glasses behind the bar, listening to you as you ramble about your troubles. He patiently listens, seldom saying much. He serves you food and drink, and he's generally pleasant to be around. And in your mind, at your lowest point, you think, you know, this guy's the only friend I have in the world. Well, Nehemiah, he served a similar type role for the king of Persia. Well, one day, one of Nehemiah's brothers came from Jerusalem to visit Nehemiah in the royal city of Susa in Persia, and Nehemiah asked how things were going back in Jerusalem, and his brother told him things were terrible. They'd been prevented from rebuilding the wall that surrounded the city of Jerusalem, leaving the city defenseless against her enemies. Other living in the area, their enemies opposed every move that the Jewish people made and sought to constantly keep them down. Over 70 years had passed since the rebuilding of the temple and they were unable to make any other progress. These people were discouraged and demoralized. Well, it broke Nehemiah's heart to hear about the suffering of the Jewish people back in his homeland and when he heard the report from his brother and said he broke down and he wept. It may be hard for us to really fully appreciate how Nehemiah felt when he heard the news about his people. These people had a very strong feeling of connection with each other as a people group. Even though they didn't live right next to each other, they lived in other countries and many miles from one another. An example that came to mind for me from our own past that begins to approach the kind of feelings that Nehemiah would have had is how many of us felt on September 11 in 2001. 
even though we may not have personally known a single person in the city of Manhattan, as we watched what was taking place that day with the Twin Towers, we felt a strong connection with those people. When Nehemiah heard the news, rather than ignoring the problem and detaching himself from it or becoming discouraged, he began to pray to the Lord about the situation. Nehemiah's prayer occupies most of chapter one, and we spent our time last time looking at that prayer. It gives us a good example of what intercessory prayer looks like. Well, we're picking the story up this morning in chapter two of Nehemiah in the first verse, Nehemiah chapter two. Following the visit from his brother, Nehemiah spent the next four months praying and fasting about the situation in Jerusalem and how he could help. From a human point of view, it seemed crazy, foolhardy for him to seek God about what he could do to help the people back in Jerusalem. I mean, consider his options. He worked for the king of Persia, a man who had already made a ruling a few years earlier against Jerusalem and its rebuilding. Well, kings, they didn't like to revisit issues. Nehemiah couldn't simply quit his job at the palace and go back to Jerusalem. See, people didn't quit the employment of the king. They didn't have that kind of freedom in those days. You worked for the king until he was tired of you. There was no such thing as job mobility. Nehemiah personally didn't have the kind of money or resources needed to rebuild the walls, even if he could escape the king's employment. Nehemiah didn't have the authority necessary to carry out a rebuilding project in Jerusalem. He was a cupbearer for the king, nothing more. If he quit his job and ran away, he would be less than a cupbearer. He would be a former cupbearer with a sentence on his head. So from a human point of view, it may have looked crazy and foolhardy for Nehemiah to seek God about what he could do to help the people in Jerusalem. But Nehemiah knew that anything is possible with God. So he prayed, and he fasted, and he prayed, and he fasted, asking God to help and to give guidance. In our lives, we too face what appear to be impossible situations, don't we? And we don't have the power or the influence or the resources to do much of anything about it. What can we do, though? We can pray. And that may sound kind of trite, but as we'll see in the life of Nehemiah, it can be a very powerful thing. It's important that we not belittle or underestimate the power of prayer. Prayer can change the hearts of people and move mountains. I mean, many of us here this morning are sane and sober and sitting in church because of someone's prayers. Amen? Yeah. I would have never thought that this is where I would be. A lot of people didn't think this would be where I would be. And I have a feeling the same could be said about you. Verse 1, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the cup and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. It was expected of everyone when in the presence of the king to have a positive attitude, a cheerful countenance and disposition. Your own personal feelings were to remain hidden at all times. This was especially true for the cupbearer since part of his job was to keep the king cheered up and in a positive state of mind. But the burden on Nehemiah's heart for the people in Jerusalem is so great that it's showing on his face. The king can see that there's something troubling Nehemiah a great deal. So he asked, why is your face sad, Nehemiah, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. I wonder how many days before this day had Nehemiah's face looked troubled. His face had probably looked troubled many times 
over the past four months. See, I don't believe that all of a sudden Nehemiah shows on his face the distress that he's been feeling in his heart. It's been there this whole time. I mean, have you ever had someone ask you what's bothering you and you thought you were doing a really good job of hiding it all? Most of us have been caught like that by a perceptive friend, haven't we? In the case of the king, this is the first time that he has noticed Nehemiah's sad face. He had not noticed it until this day, even though it's certain that Nehemiah's face has looked troubled before now. See, I believe this is the Lord answering Nehemiah's prayer. God is opening a door of opportunity here for Nehemiah to speak with the king. The king is asking Nehemiah, what's the matter? This is what we would call an open door. Nehemiah, he had been praying that God would open a door of opportunity for him. He had been praying about how to bring this subject of Jerusalem up with the king, how to start a conversation with the king about the stuff going on back in Jerusalem. And now, the king himself brings it up. Rather than Nehemiah having to do it, the Lord is working clearly here. He has the king ask him, what's going on, Nehemiah? It says, Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. Why is Nehemiah afraid? Well, first, Nehemiah is afraid because he knows that to reveal his personal feelings in front of the king is against royal protocol. He runs the risk of being punished for it, maybe put to death for it, depending on the king's mood. Secondly, he's afraid because of the subject that he knows he's going to try to speak with the king about. Jerusalem, this same king had ruled against the rebuilding of Jerusalem before. Now Nehemiah is going to try to bring the subject up again to the king. See, ancient kings, they knew nothing of modern management practices like team building and open discussions and thriving on chaos and various problem-solving techniques. That's not the way they played the game. Once the king had made a ruling on something, it was done. And it was hazardous to your health to try to revisit an issue. Kings only moved in one direction, their direction. Well, some might look down on Nehemiah for being afraid. They might think, well, isn't this what he was praying for? I mean, wasn't he looking for an opportunity to speak to the king? Isn't this the very thing that he's been hoping and praying for? Well, yeah, but real life in the living is not that simple, is it? It might appear obvious to us that God is opening a door of opportunity for Nehemiah to speak with the king, but from Nehemiah's perspective, who's living this out in the moment, it's not so easy to know if this is a door of opportunity or simply a coincidence or perhaps a very bad turn of events that's going to cost him his life. He doesn't know really what the king is asking here, what the motivation is yet, what's going on. See, walking by faith can be scary. Walking by faith can be scary. Some people say that walking by faith and feeling afraid are inconsistent with each other. They say faith and fear are opposites of one another. But that's not true. Fear is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Fear is a natural human response to the unknown. Feeling afraid is not a sign of weak faith. Feeling afraid only becomes a problem when it prevents us from taking the next step forward that we know we need to take. Well, verse 3, the story continues. He says, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city the place of my father's graves lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. I said to the king, see, he was very much afraid, but he swallowed hard, put his trust in the Lord, and stepped forward, recognizing that this may be the door of opportunity that God has opened for him to discuss with the king the situation in Jerusalem. He does it. Nehemiah 
kept his eyes open for the opportunities that God would create for him. When the king asked Nehemiah what was troubling him, he could have answered, oh, nothing, I was just daydreaming, I'm very sorry, I won't let it happen again, sir. And he would have lived his life with the constant nagging thought of what might have been. When we've prayed and sought the Lord about something and then he opens a door of opportunity for us, we need to take the opportunity. We need to go through that door. We need to step through it even if we're not sure where it's going to lead us, even if we are very much afraid. We don't want to miss the opportunities the Lord gives us because we're too afraid of what is waiting on the other side of that door. A wise sage once said, anything I've ever done that ultimately was worthwhile initially scared me to death. Amen? Yeah. Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So I prayed to the God of heaven. We see Nehemiah praying again and again. We see Nehemiah praying throughout this book of Nehemiah. He was constantly praying. And I picture the scene here as the king asking Nehemiah, what is it you want? And then Nehemiah realizing that it's now or never for him to lay out his plan before the Lord, I mean before the king. So he offers up one last quick prayer under his breath to the Lord and he goes for it. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if my servant, and, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. So when the king asked Nehemiah what he wants, Nehemiah has something to say. He's been praying and planning for four months. And now that the opportunity is given him, he doesn't waste it. Nehemiah had a plan. I've heard people say, I don't plan because I don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. That's one of the most naive things I've ever heard in my life. I believe the Holy Spirit inspires plans, actually. I believe God wants us to be responsible and make the most of the opportunities that he gives us. I believe God gave me a brain and he expects me to use it. I believe that if you aim at nothing, you're going to hit it every time. And you will have accomplished nothing. See, when we read in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 16, that we should not boast about what we're going to do tomorrow, James is not saying that planning is wrong. He's saying that the plans that we make should always be in submission to the Lord. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Nehemiah had a plan. We should have a plan. Pray it through, think it through before the moment comes so that you are prepared as much as you can possibly be to take advantage of the opportunities that God is going to bring. And what is his vision, he says, that I may rebuild it. Think about the immensity of this plan that Nehemiah has. I mean, what vision this guy has. One man going to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls surrounding the city, a job that others have attempted and failed to complete many times over the last 150 years, a task that has faced the opposition of the kings of the Persian Empire itself. I mean, who is Nehemiah to think that he can do what others had been unable to do? Imagine what he must have said to himself the first time this thought crossed his mind as he is praying and fasting over this four months, seeking God about what he can do to help his people back in Jerusalem. Rebuild the walls yourself. That's crazy. That's insane. You can't do that, Nehemiah. How presumptuous to even consider it. But it kept coming back. Rebuild the walls. 
lead the people, Nehemiah. See, it doesn't matter what you have been asked to do. It matters who asked you to do it. It doesn't matter what you've been asked to do. It matters who asked you to do it. If the Lord is the one who called you to do it, then go for it. Respond to the call of God in your life. No matter what the apparent cost or sacrifice, no matter how large or impossible the task appears to be, it's worth it. You won't regret it. Do it. I got an important piece of wisdom from the movie Parenthood many years ago that I've never forgotten, but I need to remind myself of every once in a while. Some of you may remember that movie. You maybe have seen it. But Gil, the father, has been complaining about his complicated life in this scene. And Grandma, she wanders into the room and she says, When I was 19, Grandpa took me on a roller coaster. Up and down, up and down. Oh, what a ride, she said. I always wanted to go again. You know, it was just so interesting to me that a ride could make me so frightened, so scared, so sick, so excited, and so thrilled all at the same time. She said, some didn't like it. They went on the merry-go-round. That just goes around. Nothing. I like the roller coaster. You get more out of it, she said. The roller coaster of life can frighten us, annoy us, make us sick, but it also is exciting and thrilling and a whole lot more fun, isn't it? The merry-go-round is predictable and safe, but it's boring. Jump on the roller coaster. You'll get more out of it. Verse 6 says, And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. See, Nehemiah, he had already figured out what he was going to need to accomplish his task. When the king asks him what he would need, he gives him a detailed list. This guy's ready. He's planned it out. We see again that living by faith and trusting God doesn't mean we're supposed to ignore our own responsibilities to plan and prepare and use our brain. The Revolutionary War soldiers used to have a saying, trust in God and keep your powder dry. Trust in God and keep your powder dry. In other words, success is in the hands of God. But it's our responsibility to be prepared to fight when the opportunity is given to us. The last sentence says, And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. I love that verse. Nehemiah recognizes who deserves the credit for his success the Lord. Nehemiah had prayed and asked the Lord to grant him favor in the presence of the king. The Lord has answered his prayer. Oh, the good hand of the Lord, may it always be on your life. Well, in closing this morning, I want to summarize what we have learned in this part of Nehemiah's story about walking with the Lord, about living by faith. First, when we're faced with a difficult situation, the first thing we need to do is pray. Nehemiah was a man of prayer. He prayed all the time. It's got to be the first thing we do. Go to God in prayer. Second, walking by faith can be scary. It can be scary 
But feeling afraid is not a sign of weak faith. Fear is a natural human response to the unknown. Feeling afraid only becomes a problem when it prevents us from taking the next step forward. So when you're faced with this difficult thing and you're feeling afraid, doesn't mean you're checking out. Use that fear to drive you to the Lord, to depend on him, to cry out to him. Third, we need to keep our eyes open for the opportunities that the Lord creates for us. In other words, expect results when you pray and look for them. So funny, isn't it? We'll be praying, Lord, help me with this thing, make this thing happen, and then, and then this thing happens, and we sit there and go, and now what? I mean, it looks like he, he, maybe he answered my prayer. Yeah, maybe he did. And maybe we need to walk through that door. Expect results when you pray. Expect it. Look for them, because it's going to happen. God answers prayers. We need to be prepared for and plan for going through the doors of opportunity that the Lord opens to us. And then here's, here's a big one. We need to go through the doors that he opens for us, trusting that the Lord is guiding us and providing for the next steps that we'll have to take. See, you will probably not have all of the details and the answers when that door of opportunity comes. There will still be lots of unknowns. But the Lord will give you enough to take that next step. Trust him with the rest. Last, we never want to forget who brings the success, the Lord. It's the good hand of the Lord upon us. The good hand of the Lord upon us. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we want to thank you for Nehemiah's story. I mean, what a, what a great story that you have laid before us, Father, of one of your children walking with you, working it out in life. Trusting you, crying out to you, and watching your good hand on his life. Lord, we want to we want to walk with you in the same way. Trusting you, praying to you, expecting, watching, preparing. and experiencing the good hand of the Lord upon us. I pray for each one of your people here this morning, Lord. Bless them. Touch them with your goodness and your love. Strengthen and encourage. We love you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.